Good morning and welcome to Society 2045's Friday Calls. This is an opportunity for us to interview interesting people from around the world, find out what they're doing and hear about their positive visions of what the world might look like in 2045. Today's guest is Todd Hoskins. Todd, we're going to let you introduce yourself. So who are you today? Well, today, my, my morning started with an apple grafting virtual workshop. And so I am full of wonder about life. And there was over 150 people in attendance. Uh, thank you to the Seed Savers Exchange uh, for putting on such amazing events. And I'm really struck by the, uh, t the tending to life, the process of of grafting a tree uh, requires a lot of care and precision. And frankly, I didn't know how to do it. Um, and so I am I feel uplifted both by knowing how I could potentially graft our 140 year old apple tree um, and uh, by all the people who were there who were so engaged in asking questions and I think that'll probably be a theme for the, today is the dynamics of life. And that's, I got to experience it first thing this morning. Sounds fantastic. So you and I just met recently um, through mutual friends and uh, we held a call where you shared with me some of the many things you're working on. Uh, there seems to be a pattern in your work. Do you wanna talk about that? Just let us know some of the projects you're working on and how those fit together. I had a period of my career when I worked in the corporate world which is a whole nother topic, and then startup technology companies and ended up launching a company in 2009 called Canopy Gap. And that's a very meaningful metaphor uh, to me, a phenomenon that happens in every forest ecosystem where somehow there has to be a way for the light to reach the forest floor for regeneration to occur. And that I could have a long conversation about the various ways that forests um, on all corners of the globe coordinate the creation of those canopy gaps so that new cycles of life can, can form. But when I formed Canopy Gap in 2009, I thought we were going to be a strategy firm because um, that's what I did. I came up with ideas, helped people come up with plans for executing them and became disenchanted with how strategy works. Uh, that sometimes the, the smartest people, greatest talent, lots of resources, and still uh, there may not be success or there may not be movement towards well being. And so became fascinated with these intangibles. Um, what else is at play here besides ideas and plans and execution? And over time, that became uh, an exploration that will never end. Uh, what's going on in the world of the invisible that influences what is visible? So when you ask Ken about patterns, really what exists across all the, the projects that, that we're working on is uh, what are the dynamics of life that are at play and how can we uh, arrange various people, practices, processes uh, to be in sync with those dynamics of life. And so that comes into play through facilitation, uh, through working with groups together, uh, cross sections, teams, um, or a lot through uh, networks where there's multiple organizations. Um, and so public private partnerships seems to be a thing right now. Um, where you have government uh, involvement, funders involved, nonprofits, for profits, and communities. And I think one of the things we're looking at uh, here in the coming decades is who is going to help coordinate all of these actions and how can we do it without a mechanism of control? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really what's on our plate and in our hearts at Canopy Gap. I love that. We often ask the question of how can we create coherence without control, which seems to be very much what you're pointing to. What have you learned about that? There's nothing wrong with the, the impulse towards control. Uh, I think it's one of the ways that humans um, 
try to deal with all the uncertainty and, and our, our feeling like that we don't have full power over the outcomes in our life is that we, we, we want that impulse to control. And I, as much as I'm aware of that in my own life, it pops up every day with clients, with family, uh, with my own projects and development, that impulse for control. Um, I think in teams and groups, it's helpful to point out when that's happening in a, in a gentle, non-shaming way um, and to show them alternatives, but also to provide some context that this is part of uh, the age that we live in that is starting to come to a close, this age of control that for, you can say for the last 200 years or maybe even the last 500 years, that we've been pretend, pretending that the world is predictable, it's controllable, and you can understand it if you break it down into parts. And from that way of seeing the world, control becomes our means of both analyzing and executing on the plans that are made. And I think that we're in a big transition right now, knowing that the age of control doesn't really work it doesn't work with the dynamics of life, doesn't work with teams, it doesn't work with relationships. And there's a reason that that exists be, is because of the way we've seen ourselves, uh, humans within life, that we are machines. We've been seeing ourselves as machines and whether we're an uh, individual body, thinking of the brain and the nervous system as a computer and its peripherals or as a team where if a part, a person is not working, we replace that part. We don't think about the rest of the system, that part needs to be removed or oiled. So this uh, shifting how we see the world is going to take time, but it will accelerate and we will move beyond the age of control, I believe, um, but that's, that's a very difficult thing to, to overcome from a personal standpoint, from a collective or institutional standpoint. And I just think in, in Western culture, especially overall, um, that's the age I was born into. Glad you're here. And what a perfect segue to allow me to ask this question, which we always ask at some point in the interview of what we're doing here is curating positive visions of how the world might look in 23 years. So I know that you know the challenges we face are large enough that we're not going to have them all solved. But the beauty of looking out, you know, 20, 25 years is that you can kind of clear the immediate stuff off the horizon. And based on your work and what you're seeing, what do you think the positive trends are that, that might be showing up in 2025 that you're working towards? It's such a fun question. So I want to go back to the visible versus the invisible. And let's add to that the measurable versus the immeasurable. Mm. David Bohm, the scientist at one point said, the next iteration of science will be beyond measurement. Mm. And that is a hard thing for many of us, or not all of us to grasp is, what is science if not forming a hypothesis, experimenting, measuring your results, and repeating the pattern? to see what works. So the, the invisible, or you could say the immeasurable, plays such a gigantic role in everything that happens because that is life. Life itself is not measurable. I cannot measure the relationship with my children. It's shifting moment to moment. Any number or even um, assessment that I would make of that would be so incomplete. And if we think of all of our relationships, not just human to human, but my relationships with my, my work and with my environment, all of these relationships, there's, there's a value in measurement. I don't want to say that we should do away with measurement altogether, but what's been discounted is that which is consistent with the dynamics of life. These immeasurable flows that happen in all relationships. And so I see signs, openings, that we are moving closer to an embrace of 
yes, there are things that we need to uh, plan and execute. There are things we need to measure and, and quantify, but there's also all of these other life processes that go on um, that we want to give credence to, that we want to value. And with that shift, with recognizing and embracing the invisible, sure, some people will say, well, someday all of it will be measurable. And that's a fun debate, debate to have, but let's just say that there will always remain that which is immeasurable because it's all in flow. When we talk about the dynamics of life, one of the reasons dynamics is such an important word is because it implies motion. And life is always shifting and changing. With this apple grafting workshop this morning, the first thing I wanted to do was to go outside and look at our apple tree and to see that just with the rains of this week, uh, sorry to you Californians, I wish I could send some rain out to your direction. <laughs> Please. Um, <laughs> with the rains of this week, um, the budding on the trees has started. And all of these shifts that are visible outcomes of invisible processes. Some of them are visible, but some of them are invisible. Um, that would have such a great impact on all the beings that live on this planet if we recognize uh, the importance of what is invisible and what is immeasurable. Now, I'll, I'll give you one example of that. Um, we'll often say in our work that we are not consultants, we're facilitators. And maybe that's a semantic difference. Um, to come in, the baggage of the word consultant is I come in, I assist, I listen, and then I give you advice. And the worst form of that advice is when it's static advice, is when I deliver some sort of binder to you that you are supposed to execute as if a blueprint or directions are valid for all time. The facilitator comes in and then rather than bringing answers and expertise, we're bringing the ability to build bridges between ideas and concepts and creativity and people and standing alongside them as these bridges are built while we're building capacity for them to do the same thing. So great facilitators are always leading to more facilitators being created just by their essence. And facilitation in that form of it, which is not just meeting facilitation, um, the bridge building is something that is needed within the invisible because we don't have blueprints for the well being of all life. It is something that we will always be. Uh, adapting to understanding more deeply and facilitation in all of its forms is needed in those active processes that involve the dynamics of life. So that's, that's a couple things. I think I want to add one more is, is just the tending to life. Uh, the tending to life itself. This just came to me in, in being a part of this workshop this morning, how uh, we had a camera on a person with a, uh, a bench grafting knife watching very delicate little cuts being made and everybody was glued to what is happening. They want to understand how is it that we tend to this life? And we have neglected tending to all life. We've neglected, we've neglected tending to people who don't look like us, who are foreign to us or don't think like us, um, but we've also not been tending to life as a whole, that is which is non-human. And as we tend to life, as we tend to this life and these dynamics of life, we, come, we become more in sync with life itself and it naturally leads to more outcomes that direct us collectively towards well-being. So I'm I'm excited and I'm incredibly hopeful. And I'll, I'll just give you one example in working with some agencies in the federal government uh, over the last six months. And there's exciting things happening. And, and I would say many pockets of public private partnerships, but the traditional ecological knowledge core 
of the Army, Army Corps of Engineers is spending time with Native Americans, with indigenous elders to learn how do we care for our landforms, our waterways, um, as, as coming to people who have had more relationship with the land and the water. The traditional ecological knowledge project is the Army Corps of Engineers saying, we can learn from them, not we're going to tell them what to do or what they can't do, which has been uh, the history and the legacy. And the people are so excited to be working on this on all sides uh, because it's stretching the way that they see their world, their work, um, beautiful collaborations that are taking place. That's so exciting to hear. I've been studying the work of uh, Bio uh, Akomalafe, who's a wonderful man from Nigeria. And uh, he says, you know, my elders teach that the entire world is alive. And when you know the world is alive, you sit down and shut up once in a while. And I just love that as a as a practice. And I know you also have been doing some work with uh, indigenous peoples yourself. Can you talk a little bit about what you're learning from that? First of all, uh, an endorsement for Bio. Um, his writing is beautiful, but I encourage everyone to listen to his voice. If you can find podcasts that feature bio, uh, soak them up because he is, uh, he's a poet. He doesn't, I don't think he tries to be a poet, but he's naturally a poet. So one of the projects that we're, we're working on right now is the Tribal Resource Center. And this really came into play with uh, the amount of money uh, that the federal government here in the United States has released to or promised to release to tribal nations uh, to give them broadband connectivity. Uh, there was a, a big uh, concern from Indian country uh, to one of our nonprofit partners, the People Centered Internet, that this is a dangerous situation with all of this money flowing um, and sure enough, there's been uh, a lot of attempts at profiteering and doors being knocked on left and right. And we need a trustworthy source of links, articles, information, referral sources for how do we utilize this money? How do we acquire this money? How do we utilize this money? And then how do we um, get the benefits of broadband connectivity that lead to more community resilience. This is a, it's a great example of kind of this large scale ecosystem level partnership, which is, it's Indian led, uh, the TRC is, uh, but it's also being supported by the three agencies in the federal government, two NGOs, a handful of technology companies, a university, and all wanting to bring this together so that um, the 574 federally recognized tribes um, can have confidence in how they're spending their money and what that will go to. Our role in this is as facilitator to make sure that the interactions that are taking place are all leading to outcomes that benefit the tribes and that everybody is, is energized and feel like they are participating in the process. It's, it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of complexity. Um, for me, that's often synonymous. If, if it's complex, then it's fun. And I love the fact that you use the word facilitate rather than consultant, facilitator, because I also consider myself a facilitator. And to facilitate means comes from facile, means to make easy. So I introduce myself as I'm here to make things easier for you, right? Uh, we have to go thread through some difficult conversations. And I notice in... Um, the, the, when we had our first conversation, you shared some diagrams with me, and at the center of all your work is well-being, which just makes my heart feel good, because I think we need a well-being paradigm um, in every level, at business, in communities, in governance, in education. If, if well-being was the, the beginning and the end point, and everything in between. How do we how do we facilitate well being? So, speak a little bit about how you facilitate well being in all the different areas that you work in. That's a great phrase to use: the beginning and the end point. Um, because if we are participating with the dynamics of life, those you could call it life force. 
it is my strong belief that there is a force of life that leads towards well-being. Maybe not of individual people or as to humans, but life overall takes care of life. Or as Janine Benius says, life creates con conditions conducive to life. And so uh, the way that we look at it, well-being is an outcome of being in this process, the dynamics of life, being in right relationship with all of life. <laughs> but it can also become a barometer for what are the decisions that we're making and how does that affect well-being, especially downstream from us. So if we are in a, a decision-making capacity to hold up well-being and, and by well-being, I don't mean just physical well-being. I mean well-being of, of uh, my emotions, my, my spirit, uh, my thinking self, and then all of life overall. You know, we've, we've had this create no harm model that I think is a stepping stone to uh, let's not just avoid harm. There's, there's something else happening here that life leads to life. So let's, let's find where that is. And so if we are in a, um, uh, let's say that there are 10 various parties in a room who want to start uh, an initiative of working together, at some point early in that process, asking what does well-being look like for all of life that's involved in this, and that includes the plant life and the water and the air, is it sounds like it's just a feel-good thing, but it also leads to thriving. It's not just for itself. The people who are involved in projects and initiatives or work for organizations that actually lead to well-being they're engaged in their work, they love what they're doing. And there's more and more organizations that are, uh, there's elements of them that are doing that. And what I look at at 2045 is how do we coordinate? We're in the process of doing it, coordinating all of these various actions, not so that they're one coordinated action, but so that we're a, a network of actions being taken with this communication system that we know what's happening where and what's working and what's not working. I'll refer to that sometimes as wiring the organizational or the collective nervous system. And, and that is um, in our siloed departments and in our walled communities and gardens and in our organizational competitiveness, often those communication flows that are so key are not happening. But I, I, as a means of encouragement, I can s say that every week I'm involved in conversations that are across institutions about doing something that is not just for our benefit, that is not just a feel good, guilt alleviation, sideline sort of corporate social responsibility, but th this is, we need to tend to life. So this is a question that I often get asked in my own work of you what know, kind of resistance do you encounter? When you start talking about well-being in organizations, and... there's a paradigm that we run into here, and that is uh, the idea that it has to be free market, pure free market. It has to be pure competition. Um, that in order for anything to succeed, we need to pit everything against each other and see what wins. Um, if you follow what's, what's happening in evolutionary biology over the last 20 years, you know, there's been all of these anecdotes and, and understandings that cooperation and competition have this symbiotic relationship. That it's not that competition is bad, it's that we've removed cooperation from competition and the, the worldview that we run into sometimes around well-being is we need to look out for ourselves. And that's actually, this, this is the point of view, that's actually best for the world because um, 
whatever ends up on top is should end up on top. And that goes for climate efforts, that goes for um, even you know, nonprofits and NGOs that are trying to make the world a more um, equitable and thriving place. There's this idea of that. So to open it up to well-being, if you're limiting well-being, if you only see it as it's for my company, and immediately you're going to get resistance. We've, and there's fear involved in that of, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want my company to, to go under. And that's all legitimate. There's a lot of resistance that is based upon worldview. And then there's resistance that is just completely our fear circuitry that gets triggered. And I mean, it's another thing that I feel very strongly about here, especially in the world we live in now for the next couple of decades, is people and facilitators especially need to know how to deal with fear as it's encountered. When I am, if I'm facilitating a group and fear comes up, and a lot of times fear will come up as doubt or violence um, or checking out, uh, removal, all these ways that to, to be able to have compassion for that that there's a reason that is happening and we need to be gentle with all of that is happening to make room for it and not react to the reaction, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. Do you also, um, this comes from a systems, uh, system-centered therapy approach of recognizing every voice in the system is necessary. And so if someone has a complaint, you don't go, oh, that's just, Jim always complaining and then eventually you eliminate Jim and then, you know, Susan takes over the job and guess what? Three months later, Susan's voicing the same complaints. How do you work with, with systems when you encounter voices of resistance or a complaint? What's your approach to help people see the whole thing as opposed to that's the identified patient? Being able to offer a cry for help or send a signal is necessary to have the openness to that at all time. And that is different than whining and complaining. <laughs> Often when we're doing extended work uh, with teams or with groups, we will bucket off the, we'll call it uh, free form negativity where people can just express what's frustrating them. And often they'll get to a point of laughter um, because it kind of builds on it itself. That you, we need space for that. I mean, that, that goes back to the machine metaphor. If you think that I need to shut down my emotions or my reactivity um, just because I'm working on something with a bunch of people, that's not true. So there's, there's that element of it. And then the system needs to be able to see itself. And not everyone can see everything in the whole system. So we cannot possibly uh, equip people, especially on large complex projects to know everything that's happening. That's one reason why transparency is great in terms of information and communication is if I want to find something, I can go find it, but I cannot be sitting in meetings six or eight hours a day having people give me updates and expect that that's going to be an effective way of doing it. So ways that the system can see itself is one, having leadership and, and we could talk about the different forms of leadership that would be most effective in this, but having leadership that is available, available to advocate for finding out information, finding missing pieces, having information and knowledge that is transparent and available, and then finding ways to cross-pollinate on a regular methodic basis that goes beyond just the standard updates. This is what we did. This is what we're, um, it's, it's much more than a 15 minute standup. You need to, to make room for synchronicity in that, in that cross-pollination. When we get down into the, the details with, with teams and organizations, the system seeing itself is each, each team or organization finding a rhythm 
for how they can do that cross pollination and then uh, making sure that it's it's a safe enough place where people can ask what they feel like are stupid questions because that's a huge thing mm -hmm. uh, where they can be wrong where there is some um, means of I can uh, question something and not get punished for questioning it that's all very important mm -hmm. uh, but also just the uh, the ar architecture of of communication needs to be such that people have their own agency to see the system as as it is in in the way that works for them. I want to thank you. This has been really juicy and 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 fulfilling for me. I hope the folks listening have also gotten a lot of benefit here. But uh, anybody have any questions for Todd? Here's a question that is something that I find myself usually asking, because at the core of all of the expressions of yours about large systems and making them work and 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 systemic change is the communication channels because you know communication is the oxygen for for any large system it requires yeah. human beings to be different and so what are you doing in that area to make the human operatives in the system in a different in a different way getting people beyond you know maslow's lower hierarchy of needs uh, to to be functioning with some level of generosity of spirit towards the people that they're working with so that there is that um air in which creativity can kind of bubble up and there's not a sense of competition which which is so prevalent in so many large organizations um, great question, Stuart. So one of the things that we often say is diversity is the fuel of creativity. Um, but in order for that diversity to manifest in a way that is beneficial, there has to be the, the, the space or the container where that diversity can move and communicate and flourish. So one of the things we always look at, this is getting back to the invisible, is the dynamics within in this when whatever group, and it moves beyond safety. Safety is a part of it, but can I fully show up as myself and my unique way of seeing the world? And if that's the case, then there are ways to um, introduce the many forms of diversity uh, any into any system or any. Um, network or any team or organization. And, and that is you create rituals in which external stimuli are constantly introduced. So the, the machine way is we need to focus on the project, the task breakdown, the schedule, the deliverables, the deadlines. That's, there's still a place for that. That's, that should not be erased, but there also needs to be a little bit more winding on the path. And there needs to be a bringing in of external perspectives that are wild, wildly different into the system. Uh, external experiences too, not just perspectives, but experiences. And then hopefully over time, the internal diversity on any team, uh, the way of seeing the world, the background, um, I mean, it, it includes nationality, race, and gender, but the, the many facets of diversity go beyond that, that then that diversity more manifests in, in, in any team. Um, but we can't, you can't do one training and get there, and you can't uh, mandate it, you can't create a set of guidelines, like that is that's a gentle shift in human behavior. And too often we come at it directly um, instead of um, introducing things slowly and methodically over time. Great. Um, so follow-up question. How do you factor in <laughs> what I'll call the capitalist mindset, the capitalist brainwashing, the profit and loss piece? Because that also seems to be you know, one of the one of the critical factors in large system shifting that most people are just kind of 
brainwashed for want of a better term in assessing human activity uh, through that lens. We could have a really long conversation <laughs> about this, Stuart. I think we're gonna have to hang out after 11 o'clock here. <laughs> um, but I think there's one useful specific that I can speak to rather than trying to cover the whole territory and that looking for individuals, whether that's individual people or individual units or teams or organizations who do not feel bound by the current form of capitalism in order to uh, engage in something that is, is willing to stretch capitalism. I'm, um, I'm not anti-capitalist because once again, we're looking at the visible, we're looking at the outcome. Whatever is more oriented towards well-being, the next iteration of our system, probably we don't have a term for. It's not something or something. It's not capitalism or socialism or communism or cooperativism. Like that is, that's, that's, that's the old machine-like way of saying is it has to fit in a category. And so if there's openness in a team or an organization saying, yeah, you know, we want to make profits, but that's not it. Boom. We can work with you. Beautiful. Okay, great. Thank you. So what I hear is almost like a little bit of a, um, a parallel system that's kind of emerging. Absolutely. That's, that's, Absolutely. That's emerging. Okay. Um, I just want to take one, one second and share this with you because it seems, seems appropriate. I curated and edited a book called The Best Lawyer You Can Be, A Guide to Physical, Mental, Emotional, and Spiritual Wellness. And it's all about uh, 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 the well-being movement of all places within the legal profession. All right. So mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> Yeah, more conversation. I think we're, we're all learning our way through the morass that we're in. Um, I had an opportunity to work on this fabulous documentary film uh, a couple of years ago called Fantastic Fungi, <sighs> The Magic Beneath Us, and learned so much um, from um, direct of around the networks and what's possible and how mushrooms communicate and trees and all that that we all know. And it was really amazing because throughout my career I worked at around human dynamics and mechanics. And um, what we have created are machines of misery, not just created but inherited from previous generations are machines of misery. And lately I've been thinking a lot about um, the fact that the surveys and what they're measuring, and I'm a former public opinion pollster, so I have a background in, in knowing um, how human behavior also gets manipulated um, through surveys. I'm wondering, is there, a, is there a way for us, especially looking at Society 2045, to look at ways to start communicating and sharing information, not on the misery, not on the level of disengagement, not on all the negative stuff. And because I, I agree with you about facilitation, but leadership is not outside ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's up to each of us to own our power and, and, and walk mm -hmm. the path and mm -hmm. ask the questions. And I'm wondering as facilitators, is there a way for us to bring in a new wave of questions that allow people to really understand what it's like to be in a network or community or to really look at the invisible because everybody's facing it and people resist change mostly because they don't know how to change. Well, first, thank you for your work on Fantastic Fungi. I love that film. And that's, that's another topic we could go off on too. Um, what you're bringing up is, is uh, it, feels, it feels really core because if we go back to the machine metaphor and the age of control we need to find the method and the way and we if one way is not working we need to find a replacement way and as as collectives and as groups we need to let go of the way and we need to be in a mode in which we are open to constant 
experimentation and the communication that comes along with that of what is working and not let it get stuck in a way. So for example, I have it asked me, so it sounds like you're a fan of appreciative inquiry, are you? And I said, I love appreciative inquiry as long as you don't hold it too tightly. Like to be able to follow the path of what is working and where the energy is, that's great. But we also need to be able to address where there's blockages and we be, may be able to find what we're not seeing uh, together. You know, if I wanted to instill in a network uh, a capacity, that capacity is, is not to do one thing well. That capacity is this dynamic within that collective that we can keep trying new things and have these this constant open feedback loop where we know how those new things are going and we can continue to try. That doesn't mean it's chaos and you're just randomly doing a bunch of stuff uh, because you need to uh, uh, assess those actions in a way that once again is oriented more towards well-being than well-being does not always mean that I feel good afterwards. Sometimes well-being, like when I exercise regularly, I feel great afterwards while I'm exercising, I don't feel that great. And that's, that's, there's a corollary to well-being. If you're on a track of well-being, it's not always going to feel great, but you're eventually going to be able to see it together and then you'll feel some momentum with it. Well timed. We're just about at the top of the hour. We have time for one more question if anybody has one. Last chance, any more comments, any questions? I have one last. What can we be doing together more? Hmm. Or less? And how? <laughs> that's, that's a lot for two minutes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think this is a great thing to close on. What does it mean to share and listen from the heart and not just from the, the brain? To share and listen from the heart doesn't mean that you get gooey sentimental. It just has a different quality to it. And I know where I'm at right now, I wanna spend more time with people who are sharing and listening from that place. And so if we can help evolve any circles that we are in towards a uh, thinking cognitive focus to a, a introducing the heart layer to that, not neglecting um, the cognitive, but introducing that to it, then I think that would be fantastic. I think that would be both fantastic and powerful. What a great way to end. Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to see you again and to be back in conversation. Let's keep this going. Thank you, everybody else who uh, showed up today and for your questions and your attention.